In the early 80s, when computers were really coming into their own and becoming more commercially available, there was a wide range of options available to consumers at any price point you could imagine. At the lowest possible end, you could get something like the Sinclair ZX81, also known as the Timex 1000 here in the United States, for about $79. More towards the mid-range, you could get a Commodore VIC-20 for around $299. Stepping up into the big time, though, you could get an IBM PC for between $1,500 and $3,000, depending on how you configured it. IBM seeming to think that the $1,500 configuration was viable, even though you had to go up to $2,900 to get a floppy drive and a monitor included with the system. But what if money is no object, and you want the absolute most powerful, most capable system you possibly can? Well, this is the HP 9836C, a $25,000 computer from 1981 to 83 that is absolutely insane, and now my most favorite computer I own. <laughs> The HP you know now is nothing like the HP that made this computer. You probably hear this costing 25k and think it's for greedy reasons like the DRM they put in ink cartridges now. But not for this. At this time, HP was on their own path for microcomputers, focusing mostly on power users. I've looked at the HP Series 80 computers before, and the 9836 here is essentially a direct continuation and a significant improvement to them. Later, it was even renamed to the HP Series 200 Model 36. The main purpose of the 9836 is as a CAD workstation. Out of the box, it has high-resolution graphics functionality, HPIB for interfacing with plotters and digitizers, and extremely powerful hardware. My system has the base level CPU, but it is still an 8 MHz Motorola 68K. There's a lot more to go over, but first, I'd like to take you on the short journey that was getting this machine running again. Alright, this is my first day now, after having bought this thing, and I'm really looking forward to getting it going. But there are a couple of things that are going to have to be solved. First, when I bought this thing from the seller, I was told that the monitor is broken. Spoiler alert, it's not but it's not fully functional and usable yet either, but I don't think it's the fault of the monitor, as we'll see in a moment. The other thing that wasn't actually listed when I bought it was that it has an issue with the floppy drives. I was just told this by the seller when I went to pick it up. But I'm okay with that, because I kind of figured it, because the HP Museum talks about the issue that I believe the seller was describing, where the grease on these drives kind of solidifies or gunks up, and uh, they don't really work so well anymore. So they need to be cleaned down and re-lubricated to be usable. So we need to have a solution for video stuff and a solution for booting the operating system. But outside of that, I think the outlook is pretty good for this thing. But first, let's take a look at what's wrong with the video part. Now, the display and the computer are separate units on here, and you need a cable to connect them, and it is a 15-pin D-sub cable. But it isn't a DE 15 cable like VGA, it is a DA 15-pin cable. And this is the original HP one that goes with this computer. This is, however, bad on one end. Now, I actually have the housing and bits for this, but uh, the problem is that this is a molded cable. It's missing a pin, and two of the pins are kind of wobbly and loose, at least two of them. And I don't think this cable's working quite right, but that picture that you saw of the machine actually posting is one I took using this cable. All right, what I'm doing is I'm gonna plug in that cable, uh, but I have to manually align those pins that are all loose and wiggly here, which is uh, distressing. Uh, uh, we're getting picture, okay. The intensity knob seems to be doing Nothing, so that may be one of the missing or damaged pins, I don't know, but uh, there is just barely some video there. I hope I can tease some of that out in post. Here, with the uh, exposure cranked, now you can definitely see it. So, the monitor does actually work, meaning that there's hope that this machine will be fully resurrectable, but uh, I won't really know until I can replace that cable, which 
as far as I can tell from reading online, is actually a straight through DA15 cable. So I'm hoping with a standard off the shelf cable, I can just replace that one and be good to go. And I have one of those ordered. It's gonna be delivered today, but to my house. So I won't be able to test it here now, but tomorrow I will be able to continue on with that. I don't think it makes a whole lot of sense to try and mess with that anymore for now though. So I wanna turn my attention to the floppy drives. I have a very firm rule that I will not put disks in drives of unknown condition without cleaning them first. So I want to do that. But since I don't think these drives are really functional, uh, I want to try and tear down this machine and get a better look at the drives. As far as I'm aware, these are Tandon TM100 compatible drives. So even if there are some problems with them, I think I can repair them or replace them if needed, but it's probably just the lubrication stuff. However, though, um, I don't want to take this apart over here, so we're going to move over to the workbench because this thing is obscenely heavy and difficult to move. Before tearing the computer apart, I checked the pinout of the video cable and its condition. It is a straight through cable and a number of the pins are intermittent. The one I ordered should solve the video issues. On to the computer itself so we can investigate the floppy drives. Now, there are no screws uh, visible on the top, sides, back. Uh, they're all on the bottom, I can feel. So uh, I'm gonna put a blanket on this thing and flip it over. Cool. Okay, oh wow, that's a big cap in there. Normally, that's the kind of sucker I would have liked to reform, but uh, the owner basically told me that they use this thing periodically for a long period of time, so it was probably fine to begin with, and it had already been turned on when I bought it so that they knew that the monitor didn't work, so kind of no point uh, in it this time. Now, the floppy drives. Uh, those look very Tandon-like, so... I don't think this is gonna be, uh... Why? Why are there five screws holding the plate on for the floppy drive? <laughs> oh, maybe two of those go through, but still, good grief. Uh, anyway, I was gonna say, it won't be too difficult. It'll just be long and dumb, apparently. Hmm. Yeah, let me look at the bottom again on that. Let me put two screws back in. So I think I undo that. Yeah, so that's just a guide. Um, wow, they they expected to add more giant cards. Um, whoa. So yeah, this is gonna be a floppy controller, I guess. Why are they? Oh, that makes sense. Okay, so this is 9836. The 9826 does not have this drive in it. So I guess this is a different cable from a different manufacturing assembly. All right, uh, get those screws back out and then hope I can actually extract that drive. Can it rotate enough? Oh my gosh, just barely. Excellent. After getting the drive out and getting a better look at it, I found it was just incredibly dusty, so the dirt was probably jamming the sliding parts. So all I did was tear it apart and clean it, but we're gonna skip through most of that because I've already made a video detailing exactly how to do this that I'll go ahead and link in the description. This machine does use Tandon TM102As, so this was a very familiar process to me. Okay, I've got everything connected here, um, the drive and all that stuff. Uh, I don't have the monitor connected right now. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's everything in there though, hopefully. Uh, I prepped a cleaning disc with some isopropanol. I'm gonna pop this in there so any disc sensors should be happy. Then I'm gonna press the power switch and we'll see what happens. All right, fan is spinning back there. I'm hoping to see some activity uh, in here. All right, heard the drives get power. Beep. 
Well, I don't know what that beep code is. All right, I'm gonna go see if that beep code's in the manual. Uh, I figured out how to understand error codes, not the beeps. Those are not documented anywhere. I have no idea how you're supposed to interpret those. But there are some LEDs on the processor board in there that do show error codes. That was failing a RAM test and uh, definitely there are a bunch of RAM boards in here, like all, all of, actually the, all of those are RAM boards. So uh, these change as it goes through different peripherals and things on the computer and test stuff. So those are how you see what the issues are with the system. Though they were showing uh, 1001001 as the error. So uh, yeah, glad to have figured that out because that was the RAM code for boot ROM 3.0, which thankfully I knew this had since the display has worked a couple of times. Okay, I have the new HDA 15 cable in here uh, so that we don't have to use the horribly messed up one. So I'm gonna plug that into the video port back there and fire it up. Okay, so the video cable works, but we're still getting green output. That's not optimal. I just don't like the squeaking coming from the floppy drive, but uh, we're gonna give it a shot. So what I think I wanna do here, okay, uh, I do have the actual disc and uh, I've even already imaged it. I have it back there. You can see the flux map. Also, it has like a crazy number of sectors. I don't know what's going on with that, but uh, yeah, that's it. I'm gonna put a, a non-system disc in here first just to see if it totally trashes it. Um, so let me grab a sacrificial floppy because I don't know that squeaking's making me a little nervous. What does it do if we do this? Okay, it doesn't seem to be doing anything. I'm just gonna do a shift reset. Okay. Okay, it can spin. It is squeaky. Uh, we got a read error. That's actually fine. All right, I'm gonna put the HP disc in. All right. Will it boot? I have, I have no idea. It's trying, or it's checking that it has the drive. And it should boot to basic, which is kind of weird you have to boot basic off of a floppy. Okay, it's trying, booting a system. I, I don't I don't know what the deal is with that. Basic four ready. No way. Does it live? Print. Hello, world. Okay, so caps locks on by default. Good to know, or at least the the key. Maybe no, the key, I don't think the key locks. Oh, it tells you at the bottom. What? Okay. It lives. Oh my gosh, it works! <laughs> After getting the machine up and running, I realized it was having a number of issues just related to how dirty it was inside. So I figured now that it's known to work, I can spend some time doing a deeper clean on it. Even the keyboard needed it because the keys were slightly jamming from the dust around the stems. I turned my attention there first because I wanted to try ultrasonic cleaning the keycaps and letting them dry. While that was going, I tore into the rest of the machine, finding tons of dust clumps around everything. While we're in this deep though, let's take a closer look at the hardware inside this machine and how it costs $25,000. First, when it's running, it will actually print out its configuration to the display, so let's go in order of what it shows there. Firstly, this is the 9836C, C meaning it is color. The non-color A model came with a monochrome monitor, but with an add-in card could connect to an external RGB monitor, so color was always available for these machines. The A model was $12,110, but it was another $3,030 to get the color version. The keyboard built in uses maxi switch linears and also has a programmable rotary knob. The color display built in has a resolution of 512 by 390 pixels and the standard 80 by 25 characters. The two five and a quarter inch drives with their custom disc formatting hold 264 kilobytes each. The HPIB port on the back is HP's signature that allows these machines to talk to all their other hardware. 
Back to upgrades. This has the $455-98620A DMA controller, which allows faster direct transfers to things like disk drives. The DMA card is required by the $605-98625 disk interface, which is essentially another HPIB card that is not fully IEEE 488 compliant for higher speed transfers. And this also has the $355-98622 GPIO board, which allows you to interface directly with electronic components. Lastly, the RAM. This system has 2.7 megabytes of memory, a staggering amount for the early 80s. I'm not 100% sure about the total cost of this, as I cannot find an official price for the two 98257A 1 megabyte modules that make up the majority of it. The 98256A 256 kilobyte modules were $1,060 each though, so we could extrapolate the total being near $8,000, though these were likely cheaper per capacity when they were introduced. That brings a total just shy of $25,000, but I removed a $655-98629A SRM controller though that I will never use because it's for sharing things like hard drives and printers with multiple computers on a single network of sorts. This thing is an absolute beast of a computer for the time, and it would take something later like an Amiga to match what it has here. But after all that, I've got it cleaned up and put back together. So let's see what it's like to actually use, which is unfortunately not the easiest thing to do now, and I got pretty lucky. Let's start out by looking at one of the interesting features of the basic 4.0 I booted on the machine earlier. Now I'd like to take a moment here and show you IBM PC-DOS 3.2 uh, for one particular reason. When you go to the disks at the back, you'll find it is plural, two of them. You have the primary boot disk for the machine, and then you have a supplemental programs disk. Now, the DOS basic uh, on this machine is actually fairly similar to this, but it's a little weird in how you use it because this is a completely RAM based system and you can actually load all of the supplemental programs into RAM. To show you what I mean, first let's cat the contents of this disk, which will show us all of the files on it. There's two, and I think Revit is actually just an identifier for the disk. So there isn't anything else to do with this disk, we may as well remove it, and it doesn't need to go back in while the computer is on. What we need next is the language extension disk. Now I'll mention at this point, I don't have an original set of floppies for this machine. These are all copies, but these are all the original disk copies of basic 4.0 for this machine. Actually, there is one more here to throw in. And this is what you would get when you would buy a basic set for this, along with an utterly ridiculous amount of documentation on how to use this thing. But uh, all of these disks are how you actually use this system. So let's go ahead and put in this disk now and cat it to see what files are on here. I'll also mention at this point to run a command, you can either press enter like I did previously, or like I will do this time, press the execute key. Now you can see on this disk that there are a lot of files here compared to the last one. Now to explain what this disk is, we could use another MS-DOS PC-DOS comparison because these are all essentially TSRs, terminate and stay resident programs. Now you'll see that these are .bin files. Now I'm not 100% sure about this, but every time I've run into a bin program on here, you load it with a special command and then it doesn't fully seem like it does anything. Let me show you. Let's go ahead and load clock. So we will load bin, and then we have to actually put this in quotes annoyingly, clock, and then we will run our command. And that's it, all we get. We see it shows basic clock 4.0 at the bottom. Now this is a little weird because again, this is basic. This is a programming environment, not DOS, where you're trying to run an operating system with functions going on in the background. But that's really how it behaves. These are extensions to the basic language that gives it more features and capabilities and allows it to interface with hardware in different ways. Here's a really cool way that it can interface with the keyboard hardware. If we load, load bin KBD, we will see at the bottom now, we have a section of soft keyboard overlays. 
Now the keyboard has a section of programmable macro keys essentially up here. And what this TSR does is allow you to program those keys to do different things. Now the default functions it has here are pretty handy. We have scratch for starting a new basic program, load, which we could then use to load new programs, cat for cataloging disks, Restore, which I don't actually know what does offhand, and list, which will show us our currently loaded basic program. Now, unfortunately, for the next thing I want to show you, which is the example programs disk, I'm gonna need to load all of these because when you run into a command that requires an extension be loaded, it gives you a mostly vague error number and doesn't really tell you what you need to load. So I kind of have to load all of them to be able to flip through a bunch of different programs on here. The manual actually talks about a better way of handling this. If you know you're going to be running a particular program or working with particular commands, there's a way that you can build your own disk that has these extensions that you can then load with essentially an auto-exec script. It's a really cool system and it's really well designed to have functionality like that, being able to auto run and load the things that you need in the background so you don't have to manually do it. So it's really cool, but I haven't actually set that up yet because I've been focused on so many different things with this machine, I just haven't been able to take the time to do that. So yeah, I'm gonna load them all manually now. All right, now that they're all loaded in, I will go ahead and switch over to the more interesting disc, which are the manual examples. Now, I'm not sure if these are actually typed out in a manual somewhere or not. Uh, I'm hoping that they were just supplied on a disc because there are kind of a lot of them and uh, I wouldn't want to have to type these all in myself. So if I do a cat, you'll see there are quite a lot of files on here. Now, these demos are really impressive to me, and I want to walk through a couple of them to really explain why this machine is just absolutely crazy. First off, we haven't seen color, so let's load a program that will absolutely definitely be color. Yeah, it doesn't seem very fast, does it? Now that it's fully running though, you can see it doing this really impressive color animation, but it's only able to accomplish this by cheating in a way. If you're familiar with graphics demos, you probably already know how it's doing it because what it is using here is a technique called palette swapping. There's another program that better illustrates this though. Let me go ahead and load that. Now I recorded this program earlier with the lights off so that you can see this a little easier and I'd like you to note before it really gets going that the dots are all different colors here. And as it gets going, it switches into this really impressive Starfield animation. When it's first drawing, it's actually giving away how it's doing this because each of those different colored dots are different parts of the palette of the machine as it's drawing. It can then redefine the palette colors as the program is running, which allows it to make it seem like it's moving stuff on the screen when really all it's doing is changing the color of the dots. Now this palette swapping technique was fairly common during this time and it saw a lot of use case, especially in early game consoles. One common use for that was waterfalls because why would you want to spend a bunch of time drawing a giant thing on screen over and over again when instead you could just dedicate a couple of colors to it and then cycle them to make it seem like it's animated. And that is how this machine is seemingly moving the dots away from center. It's not actually moving any graphics, it's just cycling most of the dots being black to either gray or white as they get farther out to the edges. Now, while this program is running, let me show you a cool trick this thing has that is one of the features that really blows my mind about it. Because I can press this key right here and bring back the text from the command console. I'm gonna go ahead and cat the contents of the disk while the program is running. Now you'll notice it paused it in the background, but it did get the listing of the disk and then showed it on the screen. This thing is doing basically multitasking from 1981. That's crazy. We wouldn't see that in DOS until version 4.0 and really that wasn't like 
parallel tasks like this, that was just more background stuff. Now, the animation happening in the background is your one real application, but you can at least do some work while this machine is processing data in the background. Because this really is a engineering computer that's meant to be doing work in the background. Now I want to cover something a lot more complicated, and that is getting new software onto this thing. I could just be happy writing basic programs, but there are newer versions of basic for this that would be fun to be able to use, as well as HPL and Pascal. But I don't have discs for those, I just have the basic 4.0 set. Now the HP Museum has a large amount of software available for this thing. Getting that onto this though is not easy, but I need to move this over to my workstation area to really be able to show that. All right, so demonstrating the capabilities and functionality of a $25,000, 40-year-old science and engineering computer is not the easiest thing, but it's not really because that it's, you know, boring and institutional. It's because no one bought one and there's almost no software available for this thing. Well, if you ask me, there is no software available for this thing, at least before this video. I have uploaded flux maps of all of these disks to archive.org by the time that I've released this video. And I hope that anyone who has one of these machines can use these to write a disk to be able to boot from it. Because without that, there really isn't a way to do that unless you're lucky enough to have a disk interface card as well. And getting peripherals for these things is not going to be very easy. However, I do have a disk interface card in here, so there are some more options that I can explore that have to do with the HP Computer Museum. They had the foresight to start backing up a large amount of software that can run on that computer, but the way they did it's a little weird, and I think it's mostly because they would started doing it in what seems like the 90s based on the file timestamps I've seen. But... The more confusing thing about that is that it seems like all of the disks that they backed up were actually three and a half inch floppies. Now, how they got all this software on three and a half inch disks for a system that has five and a quarter inch drives built in really confuses me. <laughs> but that's not even the worst part. The structure of disks for the HP 200 series are very weird. They have 16 sectors instead of 9, and they use 33 tracks of data per side for a 40 track drive like this is. Now if you really start looking at the disks that the HP Museum was able to archive, structurally they're very confusing. Uh, you'll see multiple different sector layouts and mixed sector types between disks. It was really confusing that the disks looked like that, and I thought that these were far more complicated in how they store data than they really are. After having done multiple days of research and investigation on this, my best guess is that somehow the disks that the HP Museum was able to archive were initially formatted for PC and then had the Series 200 software written to them, which is really confusing because HP made their own disks. If they were OEM disks for the Series 200, I would expect them to have always been 16 sectors and not 9, but I don't know. I don't know how the software got onto the disks that they were able to image. Now the other thing that's interesting is that those 3.5 inch disks should be 80 track disks, but the file systems on some of them would be actually compatible with 40 track disks, which means that if you threw away the second half of the data that is unnecessary, you should be able to write them to 5.25 inch disks that would boot on this machine. But you can't. HP is too clever for their own good. And when you start digging into the manuals for these things, you'll learn about something called sector interleave. The different drives available for the HP 200 series ecosystem all had different sector interleaves, which is a very weird thing. Now, the concept of sector interleave isn't very difficult to understand because it's mostly skipping sectors, but the implementations make working with data formatted like that very difficult. Let's say you had a really simple disk that was only four sectors and however many number of tracks. You could lay out the sectors, one, two, three, four, and as the head went over them, it would be able to read all of the data one sector at a time. 
But what if your controller or computer was slow and you get from sector one to sector two, but it hasn't finished working on the data from sector one? Well, it would then have to make a full 360 degree revolution of the disk before it got back to sector two and could read it. So sector interleave is the concept of spacing out the sectors more. One, two, three, four. And this makes it so that there is some break time in between reading sectors that would allow your computer to process the data. If your computer was slow, that would actually speed up the data rates by giving it time to process the data without having to wait for a full revolution of the disk. So HP thought it would be great to tune every single type of drive for this machine with different sector interleaves. What that means is if you take a flux map of one of these disks made for a specific drive, the sector interleave is not necessarily going to be compatible with another drive. Meaning you can't convert three and a half inch disks to work on five and a quarter inch disks. So without a three and a half inch disk drive, I can't boot any of the disk images from the HP Museum on this computer. Fun. Except, as I mentioned, I have a disk interface card, which means I can boot them, but not as disks. Let me show you something over here. This is a computer running Windows 98 on a Socket 370 900 megahertz Celeron. The key thing about this computer, though, is that I put a National Instruments GPIB card in here. Now with a GPIB card in a sufficiently old Windows system, you can run a program called HP Drive. This program is pretty cool because it actually has the ability to emulate a large number of HP disk drives. Now the disk interface card on this computer is really just another GPIB port which is compatible with the card I put in this computer. Which means if I run an emulation program that would say, hey, I'm this drive, and this computer tries to boot from it, it should be able to. And after some testing, it can. Now a file I have right here is a hard disk image for the Series 200 computer. And it is possible to use the HP drive program to boot from it. What you need to do when running the program is specify the type of drive it is, which is a 7959B. Then we can run it and it will ask to confirm that I want to use the default file name. I do. And it's now set up in emulating that hard drive. So I'm going to turn on the computer over here and it will automatically search out any drives on the GPIB bus of the disk interface card and attempt to boot from them. And there we can dimly see that it is in fact booting something. And there we are. That is basic 6.4, a much newer version of the basic software than I have on floppies. From here, we can cat the contents of the hard drive, and this comes with some pretty handy utilities, mostly the disk utilities. Now, this program runs pretty much only using the soft keys and the arrow keys, which is really weird. Now, what I'm gonna have it do first here is check all of the drives that are available to the computer on the disk interface card. So there we can see it has successfully detected the drive, and that's pretty critical. I'd attempted to do this with the floppy disk images instead, but the way that those work is a little weird, and since you're not booting them from one of the internal drives, the computer doesn't actually know where they are without you having to specify it. At the end of the listing of the drives there, you can see there is this colon CS80 comma 1400 line. That's actually the identifier for where the hard drive is, and if you want to change your drive that's currently active, you need to know what that is. And it's a little difficult to figure that out when you've never used one of these before. Now going back to this, I'm going to have it cat the contents of the hard drive again here. And there we can see those are all of the files on it. But there's not really a lot of software on there. So what I'm going to do is go back over to the Windows 98 computer. I'm going to close the drive emulator 
and then I'm going to rerun it with the 200 games file here. So to run the games application, I'm going to run HP drive and I'm going to have it emulate a 9122 drive and it's going to load the 200 games.hpi file. Now with that drive version running over here and the new disk image, which is instead of this file is this one, we can now go back over to the series 200 here and then have it rescan the drives and it will find the new one. And there we are, the 9122 drive that if we go down to, we'll have all of the games on it. Now keep in mind, this is a RAM based system. It's not actually running from that hard drive. So the hard drive loaded basic into RAM and now I have disconnected the hard drive essentially and the computer no longer has access to it. I have not experimented with running multiple instances of HP drive to have multiple drives available. I suspect you could do that and you just have to supply different addresses, but uh, it's difficult enough right now to get this thing running. So I'm just gonna make it easy for the moment. We can now finally run a more complex graphical demo on here. And I think it just has to be Pac-Man. So we're going to go ahead and quit out of the program here. And I'm going to load B underscore Pac-Man. With that loaded though, we can now run it. And there we are. That is Pac-Man being drawn to the display. Now, unfortunately, I don't know how to make it hide the soft key menu, so that's going to show up during the entirety of the gameplay. Maybe if I do, nope, I cannot hide it. It's locked those, but I can move Pac-Man around here. And uh, if we go to a power pellet, we can make the ghosts eatable. Boom, 200 points. So even though this is meant to be a science and engineering computer, there are some games available for it. Now games aren't what this thing is meant to do. It's meant to run CAD applications, but unfortunately there aren't any of those archived anywhere. Matter of fact, the HP Museum software archive that we got the games program from is it. I can't find any other HP Series 200 software anywhere on the internet. But they do have a Pascal 3.1 3D object viewer, which is kind of CAD-like. However, I ran out of time trying to get it working because it is very difficult to get software from HP Drive onto the 9836C. So that will have to wait for some time in the future. I really wanted to get it running. I just couldn't delay this video any longer. But with that, that's everything I can show you for now. I hope you enjoyed this look at an incredible $25,000 CAD workstation from HP in their prime. This probably won't be the last time this thing is on camera because I did actually buy a 9122 drive for it. And I'm hoping I can convert the discs that the HP Museum has to actually work in the five and a quarter inch drives using that. So maybe other people who have one of these can get it working without having to get more obscure hardware for it. But that's a job for another day. If you did enjoy this video, then you may want to subscribe to be notified when I release another one about this wonderful machine. If you want to help support the channel, you can find me on Patreon. But for now, that's it, and I will see you next time.